an extraordinary panel of really um, diverse people, experts in various fields. So I think what I'd like to do is dive right into introductions um, and let them actually introduce themselves and their own work. Kara, would you like to start? Good morning, thank you. My name is Kara Lapointe. I am at Johns Hopkins University where I co-lead something called the Institute for Assured Autonomy, where we make sure that intelligent systems that act without human intervention are safe, secure, reliable, and they do what they're supposed to do. I'm also affiliated with Georgetown University where we created something called the Blockchain Ethical Design Framework to make sure we drive ethics into blockchain technology. Susan? Great. Uh, my name is Susan O. Oh. I am a co-founder and CEO of an AI company called Mucker AI. Uh, we use machine learning that's been trained on stylography or patterns of tactics of trolls and propagandists to uh, validate the content based on source behavior uh, with proprietary tech. And I became, I started synthesizing models for AI and blockchain integration uh, to look at the way the data was transacted uh, in a way that's uh, time stamped and transparent about three years ago and became one of nine people that helped launch uh, an NGO uh, called Blockchain for Impact, which is in partnership with the Off Office of Partnerships at the UN General Assembly. Thanks. Hi, I'm Karen Croxon. Um, I'm head of research at the uh, Financial Conduct Authority. So we regulate the UK's financial markets, uh, retail and, and wholesale. It's quite a broad agenda. And together with colleagues, some of whom are here today, uh, we're developing a, a scientific research agenda for the FCA, really integrating economics, data science, and behavioral science um, to ensure these markets are working well uh, for consumers, have integrity and stability. And also we're deploying uh, you know, a lot of the same approaches and big data internally to help the FCA operate more effectively and efficiently. My name is Ivana Bartoletti. Um, I do two things. So I'm the head of privacy at Data Ethics of GemServe, and what I do is I work on privacy and ethics by design and to support in organizations with the appropriate governance in relation to privacy, but also ethics and whatever they want to put in, we want to put in place to ensure that there is an ethics and privacy by design approach. But I'm also the co-founder of an organization called Women Leading Artificial Intelligence. And You'll all join in this room by the end of the day, all the women in this room. <laughs> and, uh, and, um, and what we do is we work on ethics um, and principles, guidelines, um, and we work with organisations like the Information Commissioners and, uh, and um, uh, competition authorities because to really work on what ethics means in practice. Uh, hi, so uh, I'm Cathy Mulligan. I am at uh, UCL. I am the CTO of something called GovTech Labs, which looks at how we put together blockchain, uh, AI, and uh, things like 5G uh, in order to create a new form of national infrastructure for um, countries. So not looking at what happens in corporations, looking at what happens for national infrastructure. I'm also a visiting researcher at Imperial College Business School, where I look at the economics of uh, digital technologies. Thanks. Great. And I'm Catherine Foster. I'm the newly appointed Chief Intelligence Officer of the Sustainable Digital Finance Alliance, which was established by Ant Financial, UNEP, and the MAVA Foundation. And we're working on greening the finance fintech industry. And I wanted to jump right in and set the parameters for our discussion, because I think it's really important to define and differentiate between what we mean by ethics as opposed to moral guidelines, etc. I wondered if uh, each of you could uh, give your perspective on what ethics is. Sure. So as an engineer, I really look at ethics from a very practical perspective. And to me, when you make seemingly innocuous decisions early in the design and implementation process with any technology, it can have resounding effects on people's lives down the line. So it's really important to ask better questions in the early stages of building technology to build better technology. Sure, and um, you know, as a founder, I see technology as largely agnostic, where I see reverse engineering and where it falls in the lie are um, as alternative as well as current legacy financial systems and business models that do not align, properly align uh, incentives, second, first of all. Second is that regulation is largely uh, set by people who are about 30, 40 years behind on the actual practices of, of how this technology is implemented. And so there seems to be uh, a disconnect in uh, defining what the technology is, what the singular promise of that transactional value of those platforms are, and how people are using it. And without those three in line, then you have technology that's either useless or that's efficient and yet without purpose. 
Um, so there are a lot of different ways of thinking about ethics, and obviously sort of a huge, huge discipline around that. Um, I think uh, you know I'll say a few words from the from the perspective of financial regulation. So. Um, you know, we're really about ensuring these markets are working well for consumers. Uh, going on every day in financial markets, you know, there's a lot of kind of quite high stakes uh, decisions that need to be taken well in the interest of consumers. So when we think about, uh, you know, sort of right and wrong, what we're really interested in is is consumer outcomes and making sure that sure that internalised in any kind of decision making process is a proper sense of what would really be in the interest of consumers. So in a way, you know, linking back to kind of philosophy, we're a bit more on the consequentialist end of the spectrum. So for me, ethics starts where the law finishes. So you do, we do have loads of legislation the impacting on artificial intelligence, blockchain, and the entire digital innovation that we put in place. But ethics is about understanding the intended and unintended consequences on what we put in place. And the reason why it's emerging, and we've been talking about this so much, we talk about this so much, is because we've seen what bad handling of data looks like um, and, and we've seen the potential and transformative potential of artificial intelligence and innovation in general. So it's about really understanding what are the consequences of it and make sure that this understanding is embedded at the very beginning of any innovation journey. Cool. I'm going to be in the academic, take a slightly broader perspective and ask what is ethical. Well, that depends on who you ask. right? So if you think about the way our technical systems are built today, what is ethical in one country is not uneth is unethical in another. That gives us massive complexity to handle in the way that we are building technical solutions, in particular if they're supposed to be global. So how do we build systems that are able to react contextually to the different ethical frameworks with which they're going to come into contact with in the same way as they're going to come into contact with different regulatory frameworks? And that's a key area of interest for me and my research. Thank you very much. There's so many other, uh, so many of those points I want to come back to, but I think also we need to define the parameters of AI and what we mean by AI. Is it uh, just artificial intelligence in terms of operational systems, or is it also embedded other technologies? And Cara, I think I'm um, looking to you particularly. <laughs> I, I guess we're going down the line. So, you know, I think just as we got five different definitions of ethics, we would get five different de definitions of artificial intelligence, right? <laughs> but to me, it's really important to think about the boundaries of what we're talking about, right? You know, intelligent agents that are that that are taking data and turning it into usable knowledge. Now, that knowledge can be used in different ways. The the kind of different vectors that I usually think about it can be used to increase situational awareness, it can be used to recommend action to humans, or it can actually act autonomously. And that's the area I spend a lot of time focusing in because when you have intelligent systems that are acting without human intervention, it is incredibly important to make sure that you are setting up all of the, the frameworks and rules that we've talked about in terms of making sure that they're acting in a way that we want them to act. Right? We've talked about the contextual nature of ethics. And I say there's not one ethical paradigm or ethical approach. It really depends on your situation, and it's important to inv involve stakeholders early on. But it's really important to think not just about AI in the abstract, but what it means when systems are acting independently. Okay. You don't have to do it in a straight line. But <laughs> oh, yeah, sure. Uh, so... You know, I always, when people ask me about the dangers of AI, I just think, well, what do you what do you mean by AI? What does that mean to you? I see AI in terms of machine learning, and they're, we're about at least maybe at least three to five years away from any intelligent decision-making uh, algorithms and agents, to tell you the truth. So I always tell people that I think you're worried about the wrong things. Uh, if you have a smartphone, you have a basically about maybe at least six to eight AI-based processors learning every step that you have and what your, uh, you know, uh, behavioral, um, I guess, trends or patterns are, learning everything about you, right? And those data sets are then uh, aggregated and then sold to different people based on which words you frequently use. Anytime that you t touch anything digital, anytime that you're in a car with notes and sensors, right, it is learning you and studying you. And then there are entire, not to scare you too much, but there are entire departments of multi-billion dollar corporations who are looking at neural marketing on how to get you addicted to their things. Right? So you're worried about the wrong things. If you want to look at uh, what I see AI, machine learning, is that it is a, 
along a long line of evolution, right? Started with steam, then went to electricity, right? And then division of labor. Now we're looking at data and knowledge, right? And we're automating parts of that. Where we really mess up are the business models. You know, what are we valuing? What are we spending our money on, right? And what systems are we, are we propagating? And those things tend to move slower unless you have, A, public opinion and awareness about it, or people stop spending money on it, one or the other. So it all goes back to people. Um, the AI just simply automates and makes faster all those processes. Thanks. So I think you know one of the big shifts we're we're seeing obviously is is this you know, AI and a largely machine learning. It's giving it's giving us this this newfound predictive power, right? So it's really making prediction uh, something much more powerful. Um, this is both incredible for us as humans. You know, it can support better decision making in many important aspects of our lives, and it brings with it some new risks, right? You know, risks of potentially sort of being better second guessed and exploited. Uh, you know, uh, by unscrupulous actors. So I think uh, when we think about it from the regulatory point of view, we're actually technology neutral. So, you know, if, if you um, want to outsource pricing to a third-party supplier that's using an autonomous system, uh, you know, we care about making sure that you really fully understand how to be accountable as a human, as an executive in that environment and make sure that you're doing the right thing by consumers. Equally, if you want outsources to, you know, he or she in the pricing department who's going to sit there and make these manual judgments, maybe with a spreadsheet, you're equally accountable. There are risks around both things. You know, with one, you might, might, might think you're going to do this more at scale, 24-7, some additional risks kick in, algorithmic bias and so on. But we really, we try and abstract away from that and keep the eye on the ball in terms of the quality of the decision and the outcome for consumers and the accountability needed around the decision architecture, the, the processes for generating good decision. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's really, really interesting. I mean, to me, when, I, when, when I'm asked what's artificial intelligence, I always say, okay, what is intelligent? And intelligence means that you react to something because of the factors outside you. So um, you do something um, because something has changed in your surroundings. And the same thing happens when this kind of intelligence is performed by a machine. In that case, you, we talk about artificial intelligence. Joanna Bryson was an so, so amazing scientist in this field. She says, well, to an extent, even a the thermostat is intelligent because you may say the temperature changes and the thermostat reacts to it. So we've gone from a sort of a process and, and things are becoming more and more complex as we move forward with more and more data that we have. Um, and I think the complexity around ethics and AI comes in because the more we inject some sort of values within the machines, the more we leave machines to make decisions without too much human intervention, the more we are worried about unscrupulous actors, but we also worry about who is making these decisions? So who is making the decisions around what are the parameters that we set into the systems? What are the, what are the, we've heard about bias, for example. I mean, the facial recognition stuff is, is, is an example for everybody. The fact that it discriminates and doesn't recognize black faces. Uh, but also the Amazon software that wasn't then in the end released, but was, uh, was used for recruitment and it was only picking up male CVs. So the issue when we talk about ethics in AI, we say, okay, AI is bringing us great opportunities, but who is making the decisions around the parameters, the weightings, and everything that goes into the system? Who is looking at the whole process? And AI is much more than algorithms. Everybody says, you know, it's algorithms. No, it's much more than that. And there's also, we can make the most perfect algorithm ever. But as Susan was saying, what is, what is it for? What are we using it for? Are we using it in our tech industry to create more and more micro-targeting and behavioral advertising and then potentially lead to another Cambridge Analytica? Or are we using it to tackle climate change or to make better finance for everybody? That's, I think, where the interface between ethics and AI comes in. Uh, yeah, sorry, just two things very quickly. I think you, you're all very correct. And uh, one, one of the things I think we need to think about deeply in society is actually if we're asking software engineers to suddenly become ethical, we need to actually train them for that. Software engineers are not taught the basic tenets of ethics, right? So actually, you could imagine, they're not taught the basic tenets of privacy either. What you could imagine is a new way to teach computer science where instead of going straight into coding, you would start with 
here are the ethics, uh, privacy, security, trust issues that you... <laughs> Could you come to my university and convince them? Because like, oh, it's very hard to convince people of this. But that should come first, and then we teach them how to code. Uh, so I think that's one, one point, right? And I think you know, that they're developing code that, in their minds, is brilliant because of the way they've been trained, right? And you know, we need to think about the way we're training people. Uh, the second point about economics... I think that something is happening here that is really fascinating. Uh, and you know, being somebody who studies economics and technology, it's a really cool time to be alive because what we're seeing is a redefinition of some of the parts of what has been our economic system since the Industrial Revolution. And the way that we uh, think about the economic system needs to change. Mm -hmm. So I think that's some really cool points. Great panel. <laughs> <laughs> I think you've raised some really interesting points, and I absolutely agree. And that leads to the next uh, part of the discussion. To me, it's not just about training uh, the the engineers and software, but also the way that we're setting our social impact challenges, for example. Most of us are working in and around that area, and a lot of us in this room, especially around the fintech space. And we've seen even the way that the challenges um, and sort of that Silicon Valley approach to hackathons and developers coming in. Uh, so we're, we're assuming that there's a tech agnostic element to this. But what does that mean? And how do we actually set these questions and the frameworks? We have decades of legacy frameworks around the sustainable development goals. Uh, I take the example of identity and banking. So for example, if you're taking those cultural and political assumptions uh, and building that into the question, even before the engineers come in, you're saying, okay, what do we mean by establishing identity in a refugee camp? Is it only people over 18? Is it only males? What are the religious, what about the data itself? Who's owning it? So I'd love to sort of jump into the social impact side and the parameters therein. I guess I'll start again. So um, I think this is really important to think about how you take ethics and put it into action, right? As Catherine said, there's been a proliferation recently about principles and frameworks in terms of how you drive ethical intentionality into AI and other associated digital technologies. But I, having done the blockchain work in terms of the blockchain ethical design framework, I often had entrepreneurs, and especially entrepreneurs who were just starting out building technology, they said, I don't have time to sit and, and go through this whole framework and, and build all these things into my technology. But I said, look, it doesn't have to be a huge process. You know, ask, bring some people into the room, some diverse folks that maybe you wouldn't normally talk to, bring them into the room and start to ask some of the questions. IEEE has a great framework, there's some other great frameworks out there that are really question-based. And you start to think about, okay, what are my big risks? You know, every, every company needs to have a risk management framework. And when you start to, to figure out what are the questions that are, are gonna be really high consequence or really high likelihood or both, those are the things you need to think about even as an early stage entrepreneur very early on. So it's really about involving people in the process. We've talked a lot about that it's very contextual. I always talk about an ecosystem design methodology. You can't design technology in isolation without understanding the complex ecosystem that it's gonna go into. So I think that, that really understanding how ethics relates to risk <laughs> is a way to think about how you can drive ethics into action from an early stage in your technology development. I'm going to, sorry, going to jump in. I'm going to shake it up. <laughs> uh, so just quickly, I think we're uh, currently entering a bit of a, a, an ethical minefield relating to technology. So I just finished the UN panel uh, report on digital cooperation. And one of the things that was raised repeatedly is that we need to be very careful about making sure we're not trialling extremely new technologies on what are effectively vulnerable communities. So, for example, in refugee camps, it's very difficult to know what the consequences of giving people, for example, a digital identity would be long term, right? It's hard to foresee what would happen in the future. Um, and I, the, the question I always ask myself is, would I put my mum or my children on this system? And I find that that actually forces me to think through some really uh, personal issues as well. And I, that's the question I always ask myself at the end, uh, once I've done all of the, the engagement as well. So, I, you know, uh, there's a friend of mine who uh, 
Adnan Hassan, who sat on the board of the World Bank for four years in a row and ran a trillion dollar family office. And he would always say, you know, uh, technology without philosophy is efficiency without purpose. So I don't, you know, everyone uh, who has ever built anything from scratch or launched knows that all of your uh, moves are mitigated by cost and risk. And you can't start building anything unless you figure out what it is that you want it to do, which is the philosophy and vision. With that philosophy, there is nothing. So, you know, and the positioning statement that, you know, when we first started working on our decks and I started working on my startup three years ago was let's start from here. The phrase is, we help who do what better through automation than, than what is currently available. And why don't we start from there? Because at least then we have the moonshot of what it is that we're trying to achieve. And then we can go down to a granular level, immediately down to how to hook it up, to look at what the transactional value of what, what we're building is. Because at the end of the day, everything that we're talking about, where, whether it's distributed computing systems or, um, or machine learning, Right, it's all inputs and outputs. At the end of the day, you're putting in one of the three, like one of the inputs to get an output for something specific that you want. And the three pillars of AI, right? Mathematical model that's translating to the right algorithm with the right secret sauce of data, right? Which is the second. And the third is, you know, the retention mechanics. Like what, how are people interacting with it and how are you feeding that loop? Right? It, it's very, it's simple, and yet when you go at a granular level specific to your use cases, it becomes a little bit more complex and nuanced. But it first starts with a vision and philosophy. Ivana, you wanted to say something? Yeah, I mean, I very much agree with all of that. And I, so I think, you know, the right approach here is to, um, you know, principles are, principles are very helpful, you know, um, and they help us to ask some of the right questions, but we have to go use case by use case and, and really be very context sensitive. Um, and I think actually this links to a broader point about how we embrace as a society, um, you know, data science and some of the opportunities there, you know, and even at the organization level, you know, you'll sometimes see an organization sort of try to do the data science over here and then the use case management over here, like what are the key questions for our organization? It's a very easy mistake to make. And I think, you know, if we can kind of try to keep in mind that we need an integrated approach connecting the scientific edge with the domain knowledge in, in everything we do, including the ethics, the legal context, the regulatory principles, doing the right thing. I think then, then that's the right track. Yeah, totally, totally, totally agree. Um, I just want to make very brief, two brief points. The first one is that uh, the companies, I think right now, they have a fantastic opportunity, especially because of what you were saying about the wider debate that is happening out there, but also in terms of our economic system and business models and all that. And there are loads of principles, there is loads of stuff out there. Um, every day there's a new set of principles coming. So I think organizations now have got the, 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 the unique chance to say, okay, what are our principles as an organization? What matters to us the most? And to translate that into real, clear governance from an ethical standpoint, that that's, that's really important. Ultimately, though, there's one thing that I want to say is, whether it's a data privacy impact assessment, whether there is an algorithmic impact assessment, whatever it is, ultimately, is all about the impact on society. Mm -hmm. And that is the most important thing that organizations need to have in mind. To do that properly, I think, in my view, diversity is crucial. Mm. Because if you ask yourself, what's going to be the impact on my technology in five, ten years' time, you need to have a variety of voices included to be able to say to you, this may happen and this may not happen. Mm -hmm. We talk about vulnerable communities. I mean, citizens' juries, for example, and a fantastic way for organizations to go out there and say, what do you think about this innovation product? Absolutely. Stakeholder involvement. Yeah. I think our time is up, but I wanted to. We've talked a lot about training, um, frameworks, guidelines, and each of you within your own organization either has produced it or followed uh, and implemented. How can we actually ensure that that happens at a wider scale? We have a lot of tools that are available, but we're not integrating them. How can we actually make that happen? I just want one final word from each of you on that, if you're able to speak to it. Well, I'll, I'll start. Uh, yeah, uh, I think actually uh, thought, depth of thought and time to think. I think one of the biggest problems we, we've got is that um, corporations are on quarterly cycles for reports. Honestly, everyone should just move to the union labor model. But, you know, that's my two cents. <laughs> Mine is to bring the entire organization together on this. Mm -hmm. Because it's not just about the developers in isolation or the, 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 the tech team and, and everybody. It's really an organizational effort to say we want to really invest in this and we do it at a corporate level. 
I think my thought on this would be focus on the decision and the end outcomes. Um, you know, Joshua Gantz at Toronto has written recently on the economics of AI. He decomposes a good decision into an element of judgment and prediction. Mm -hmm. So think of AI as the prediction. The final mile is the judgment. Okay, what needs to be packed into that judgment layer to make sure that this is a good decision in the social interest? So um, as, an, as a founder, I'm acutely aware that everything that we're building can either free people or enslave them. Right? <laughs> and anything that I build can be reverse engineered. So to get a good leaning strategy. I think most people don't understand this, is that all the, like 80% of the world's most credible uh, AI uh, companies actually come out of Silicon Valley, the technology, and most of them are through acquisition of bootstrap companies like mine. Right, and so it's not the actual like you know these giant behemoths that are coming up with all these innovative products and services. They're just swallowing up smaller companies, and the only way that I can think about it is to really look at you know uh, working with partners that are principally aligned to what it is that that we want to do and the kind of world that we want to build. Uh, everyone from the developers, the technologists, to my CFO, everyone is aware philosophically where we align in, in terms of helping people do what. Um, and be really task focused about that and to make sure that we all have a voting say in the new customers that we take on and who we sell to because uh, that's also very important. Excellent point. Mm -hmm. So impact at scale is really the critical element that we need, right? And it's not easy, but I think more than anything, we have to understand, as Susan said before, that when you're building a technology, you're driven by cost, schedule, and performance. So it's the customers that have to drive ethics and ethical intentionality into the requirements and the performance requirements for technology, whether it's governments who are huge buyers of technology across the world, especially for some of these vulnerable and marginalized populations we're talking about, and other large-scale customers. So we just need to drive it into the performance requirements so that it will be driven into technology. I want to thank this panel of extraordinary <laughs> experts in your own field, and I hope that you'll be around for at least part of the day so that we can continue the discussion. Please join me in thanking them.